Uh, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Deanna Womack, who is the Associate Professor of History of Religious and Interfaith Studies at Emory University's Hammer School of Theology here in Atlanta. She teaches on Christian Muslim relations and American Islam, and her research focuses on religious encounters in the Middle East and the United States, with particular attention to the gendered power dynamics in American Arab and Christian Muslim relations. Um, as many of you all know, Deanna wrote the book, Dr. Womack wrote the book that we're reading in one of our small groups um, right now called Neighbors. And we're so thrilled to have her with us today. Thank you so much for being with here, us, Dr. Womack, and I'll let you go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you all who are at church in person and others um, who are on Zoom. And um, as, uh, as Nicole said, um, I'm gonna be talking about building better Christian Muslim relations in the United States today. And I'm just gonna offer 10 things that I think that we all need to know or to consider um, as we're thinking about being better neighbors um, for Muslims in our own communities. And most of these points come out of um, the book that Nicole mentioned or, um, or my own teaching at Candler School of Theology. So I'm just gonna list the 10 things and then we'll get a little bit deeper um, into each one of them. And if um, you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat as we go and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and conversation. So the 10 things that I think we need to think about most um, are first looking at our perceptions and attitudes about Islam and about religion in general. We need to look a little bit more closely at the characteristics of um, the United States as a multi-faith society. Third, to consider the ways that God calls us to dialogue. Um, fourth, look at the actual forms of interfaith dialogue so we know what we're supposed to be called to do. Uh, fifth, um, examine the patterns of confrontation, historical patterns of confrontation, um, or ways that, that Christians and Western Christians in general have often approached Islam in confrontational uh, ways. Number six is look at the American Muslim roots, which are very deep in this country. Seven is consider race, gender, and Islam and how Christians have often thought about these things. Number eight is to look deeper at the diversity of Islam and particularly of Muslim communities in America. Number nine is to consider the role of empathy in interfaith relations and the important move from sympathy um, to being more empathetic in these relationships. And the last thing is talking about moving from thought to action. So the first three that I'm going to explore with you um, all call for a form of reflection. First is self-reflection, second is societal reflection, and third is um, faith reflection. So the first thing I think that we need to know is that we need to consider our thinking about religion and our attitude specifically toward Islam. So religions are not abstract entities. I find in my teaching and in my work with Christians in the US today, we sometimes, we don't think about Christianity as an abstract entity, but we do think, tend to think about other faiths that way. So to change our thinking, consider religions as being about people, as living faiths and learning about these religions through our relationships with those people. Um, another point is to recognize that no religion is monolithic or unchanging. We can look at Christianity itself to see the diversity. Um, so look and recognize the diversity of any religious tradition that you are learning more about. And also as part of this self-reflection, we need to consider our attitudes. So how do we think intellectually about religion? And then how do we feel when we consider possibilities of um, encountering people of other faiths? We need to be self-evaluative and reflective. And um, this is the, the point where we become vulnerable, at least with ourselves, um, to understand some of our attitudes or even our prejudices, and then be open to learning from people of other faiths. So that self-reflection allows us to open up and to recognize that we might learn something from those who are different than us. So here are a few questions for self-reflection. I'd encourage you, if you have something to write with, um, I'm gonna give you a few moments as I read these just to think about which one of these questions might um, interest you most and um, or which one you might need to think about a little bit more deeply. So one question is, how often do you interact with people of other faiths in general? And how often do you interact with Muslims in particular in your lives? Is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it once in a while? Um, was it 20 years ago? Um, was it when you were in college and met someone of another faith? Um, so consider how often you interact with people who are not Christian. The second question is, how much do you know about Islam and where does that knowledge come from? Um, does it come from something that you studied in school? Does it come from, from news, um, from social media? 
Does it come from the neighbor next door who's Muslim and that you've learned from? Um, or perhaps it comes from traveling in the Islamic world. And then the last question is, how do you feel personally about interacting with people of other faiths and with Muslims in particular? I'm gonna just give you a moment um, if you'd like to write something down um, or um, if you're on Zoom and sitting next to a partner and you wanna talk with uh, them about that question, just take a moment and consider um, one of these questions, um, whichever one stands out most to you as something that you'd like to work on. And then after self-reflection, we open up to looking at our community and our society. And I think that the thing that we need to recognize is that the United States is a multi-faith society and it was never only a Christian nation. Um, and in fact, we should know that all uh, that Christianity is a migrant faith in the United States. It was never originally um, a Christian nation. So American religious diversity has very deep historical roots. And this sort of societal reflection on our history teaches us, um, as I said, that, it, that Christianity is an immigrant faith. Um, we can look at Jewish synagogues that were built in colonial America, um, as well as Native, Native American um, lifeways that were present when Christians migrated here. Um, so Jewish synagogues built beginning in the 18th century, the first American Buddhist temple in the mid 19th century, the first documented Muslim prayer service in a community occurred in the early 20th century. Um, so uh, uh, quite a long time before any of us um, were born. And then if we come up to present, um, these statistics that you see on the screen come from a Pew Research Center study in 2015. Um, and so in 2014, um, the, the first um, figure shows us um, the, the um, Christian population in the US is about 60% or 70% people who self-identify as Christian. Um, those who self-identify as not religiously affiliated were about 22%. Um, Islam, as you see, is almost 1% in 2019. And then faiths other than Christianity and Islam were 5%. Um, so you see that Christianity was the majority, um, the vast majority in 2014. Um, those who were not Christian were primarily people who didn't self-identify with any religious tradition. And then if you look at the second figure on U.S. religious affiliations, um, the projections for 2050, you see that there is um, a slight change that those who will self-identify as Christian will drop down to 66%. Um, the Muslim community will grow to about 2%. Um, faith, uh, faith traditions other than Christianity and Islam will grow 1% um, to be 6% by 2020. And you also see that those who religiously affiliate with no tradition will also grow. Um, so these statistics, um, if you look at these statistics, in 2017 as well, another organization, Public Religion Research International, reported similar findings and emphasized the ethnic dimensions of this religious change. Um, so only 43% of Americans identified as white Christians within that, that Christian majority, only 40% of Americans, and only 30% were white and Protestant. Um, so the title of Robert P. Jones' book, um, the founder of Public Religion Research International, um, is quite telling for this uh, future projected reality. And the title is The End of White Christian America. Now, such statistics I can unsettle Americans who think of the United States as a Protestant nation or even more generally as a Christian nation. These statistics can be jarring for white Americans who take for granted their majority status. And for most U.S. Christians, and not just those who are white, interfaith engagement involves encounters across ethnic and cultural differences. And Americans of all backgrounds have often characterized Islam as a non-white religion. So this is a historical um, pattern of American thinking about Islam. When applied negatively, this view has made immigration and, and citizenship more difficult for Muslims. It's contributed also more recently to the rise in anti-Muslim hate crimes in the US. Now, anxieties about changing religious demographics in this country are often racially charged, as, as you can imagine from what I've just said. And in light of violent reactions to religious diversity, hate crimes and Islamophobia, um, as well as passive, more passive feelings of unease, I think it may be helpful for Christians to remember the long-standing multi-faith nature of the United States, um, as we said, um, and to properly understand these statistics, which means, as we're looking at back at figure 1.2, that, that um, we should expect more opportunities for interfaith engagement, and particularly with Muslims as that population grows. Um, but Christians will remain the majority in the U.S. for the foreseeable future. 
So I think the actual challenge, the actual thing that we need to be worrying about is for the American Christian majority to learn how to live well alongside our neighbors of other faiths um, or neighbors of no religious tradition at all. And indeed, I think that this would be the same calling for us, even if American Muslims or Hindus or Jews outnumbered American Christians. And then finally, in attending to these demographic shifts, I think it's also helpful to remember the affirmation of pluralism that drives America's promise for liberty and justice for all. And if we look at history, not so long ago, Catholic and Jewish immigrants were targeted by white Protestants as not quite belonging, but now we, we tend to speak about Judeo-Christian heritage. And so one question for us to consider is whether we can include Muslims in this common story. The third point brings us to faith reflection and the, the reality that God calls us to interfaith engagement, including engagement and dialogue with our Muslim neighbors. Um, and so there are three callings um, there are probably many more, but three callings that I like to point out this morning um, for being important in understanding the way that God is asking us to be in dialogue and, and um, relationship with our Muslim neighbors. So one is the call to be Christ's witnesses. The second is the call to cast out fear. And the third is the call to seek peace with justice. Um, so the first, being Christ's witnesses, um, uh, Christians of various theological um, traditions and various political ideologies have used the, the term witness differently, um, but I'm looking at Acts 1 verse 8 where Jesus tells his disciples, you will be my witnesses. And I think the, the main understanding of the term witness is that we as Christians, wherever we are, whatever we do, whatever we say, um, whether we're talking about uh, the Bible or Jesus or not, we are reflecting our faith. We're reflecting what it means to be a Christian and we're reflecting who Jesus is. Um, and so this understanding of witness, um, that part of our witness is to engage in interfaith dialogue, I think could help to bridge the theological spectrum um, from those who tend um, to think very exclusivistically about, um, about religion and salvation and those who are more pluralistic. So I think this calling can include um, people across the spectrum who tend not to agree um, about how we should treat our Muslim neighbors. The second point and that I would make is that the failure to act against Islamophobia, I think, is a witness against Jesus. So it, it projects an image of Christianity and an image of who we follow um, as being, I think, counter to what the gospel actually teaches. So I think that American Christians need to take seriously this risk of failing to be witnesses to Jesus Christ um, by internally, internalizing the culture of fear and Islamophobia in our society. Anti-Muslim hate um, incidents, as you may know, skyrocketed after 9-11, and they've also increased steeply since 2010. Incidents of assault against Muslims surpassed the 2001 level for the first time in 2017. Um, so there wasn't just a rise and a drop, but it's gone um, back up in recent years. So if fear and uncertainty render Christians silent when American Muslims are subjected to emotional abuse, hate crimes, or unequal treatment, then I wonder what that says about our Christian witness. I think that our failure to act or, or maybe even our failure um, not uh, to notice is a reduction or a, even a complete obliteration of the gospel. So in the face of religious bigotry in the US, I think that our faith should compel us to act. It's a, Christ, a, a critical Christian calling because to stand idly by is to deny the message of Jesus and to fail to be a true witness. Um, so in, included in God's call, I also noted casting out fear. Um, 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. There's a lot of fear in our society, and that includes fear of Islam or, or Islamophobia. And I think that there, there may be members of our congregation and our members of our community who are um, seriously fearful. So I don't think that we can set aside that fear, um, even if we don't think that it's, it's um, uh, founded fear. Um, but we need to face those fears with love. Because fear and resentment and hate can separate us from God. And so if our, if our um, orientations to life um, are focused on um, what we're afraid of or what we see as being against us or our enemy, um, then I think that actually in our own um, personal spiritual lives, um, this, this separates us from God. Um, and, and of course, we know that Jesus commands us to love our neighbors and to love our enemies. Um, but I would say uh, loving Muslims isn't about loving our enemies. I think a lot of Christians falsely label Muslims as enemies um, and then uh, perhaps would, would try to take up Jesus' challenge to love our enemies. 
But I think we need to step back and recognize that that is not necessarily the case. And we can actually love Muslims in this um, country as our neighbors. And then the third thing that I pointed out um, in terms of this calling to interfaith engagement is um, the call to seek peace with justice. So peace doesn't just mean the absence of war, at least in terms of biblical peace. It doesn't mean um, anything goes as long as we can keep people from fighting. But biblical meanings of peace include justice for the oppressed. They include drawing Christians into conflict with, with the world um, in, in the um, pursuit of justice, in the pursuit of just peace. They, um, it includes wholeness and a connectedness and well-being of all. So it doesn't just mean I can live in peace. It means everyone in my society can live in peace. Um, and as I mentioned before, peace joined in justice. And so if we pay attention to um, the rise in Islamophobic hate crimes, then I think that people in our society certainly aren't um, living in peace. And of course, this could go beyond Christian Muslim relations. Um, so that's the last point in terms of faith reflection. The fourth point, um, now if we're called to engagement, we need to know um, what dialogue and engagement looks like. And it doesn't just mean sitting around in formal um, dialogue uh, sessions, which might be something we would do um, at Candler, for example. Um, but there are several different ways of dialogue. I'm going to explain four of them. And there, there are others um, that you may have experienced or that you might think of. So one is the dialogue of life, where people strive to live in an open and neighborly spirit sharing their joys and sorrows, their human problems and occupations or preoccupations. So, um, so you don't need any training for that kind of dialogue. It's just something you do organically as part of your daily life. Another, point, uh, another type of dialogue is the dialogue of action in which Christians and others collaborate for the integral development and liberation of people. So collaborating for social justice and concerns that both Christians and Muslims um, uh, care about. Another form of dialogue is the dialogue of theological exchange, where specialists seek to deepen their understanding of their respective religious heritages and to appreciate one another's one another spiritual values. Um, we can see examples of, of theologians and um, doing this, but I think that, that, um, that everyone can um, engage in some sort of theological dialogue in understanding what, um, what our Muslim dialogue partner um, believes and thinks and how that faith um, guides them to act in the world, and we can share um, respectfully uh, what we think and believe. And then the fourth form that I'll note um, this morning is the dialogue of religious experience, where persons rooted in their own religious traditions share their spiritual riches, um, for instance, with regard to prayer and contemplation, faith, and ways of searching for God and the absolute. Um, and this sometimes, this often includes visiting someone, being a guest at someone else's place of worship, and observing um, what, it, what it's like um, to worship in a mosque, for example. The fifth thing that I would note um, that we need to know is that lack of meaningful contact, contact often leads to confrontational views of Islam. Um, so if we look at historical models of Western Christian engagement, most of that has included lack of significant meaningful contact, um, or in cases where some Western Christians are in contact with Muslims, for example, missionaries in the 19th century, the majority of Christians um, are not. And so one dominant orientation toward, um, toward contact with Islam is one that's of confrontation, whether it's political confrontation um, or whether it's religious confrontation, um, a debate and, and pressure um, to convert that sometimes happened as part of the missionary movement. Um, another orientation is collaboration. And historically, I would say that began in the, the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, if anyone has heard of the World Parliament of Religion um, in the 1890s, um, that was the beginning of people around the world, but particularly American Christians, um, thinking a little bit more broadly um, about world um, religions and, and allowing for the coexistence between Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Jews and, um, and the importance of learning about those faiths. And so I'd say um, those calls for collaboration increased um, in the mid 20th century, um, and they were enabled mainly by personal contact. Um, so global migration um, or the ease of travel has allowed um, that collaboration. And then most recently, I would say in the early 20, um, 21st century, there is an approach, um, especially in the interfaith movement today, of exploring differences. And this is possible in real relationships. So collaboration tends to emphasize commonalities which is a really important um, starting point for bringing people together. Um, but we know that, that our faith and our lives aren't exactly the same as, 
our Muslim neighbors' faith in their lives. And so there's a point when you are in a real personal relationship with a person that you can respectfully explore differences and know that although we have some common commitments, we are not exactly the same. And, and getting into those differences actually deepens the relationship. Um, we can also learn from Christians and Islamic societies. Um, so most of my research is actually on Christianity in the Middle East and the relationship of Arab Christians with Arab Muslims. So if you look on the spectrum of confrontation, um, coexistence, neutrality, rivalry, and violence, uh, for the majority of history, the, um, the relationship between Christians and Muslims in the Middle East, and particularly in the Arab world, was one of coexistence, um, or at least neutrality. So people are living their daily lives um, without violence, without rivalry, without confrontation. Um, I think that's difficult to believe if you look at at the Middle East today and the many political problems that are there that sometimes include Christians and Muslims um, on opposite sides of conflicts. Um, but for the majority of, of human history, since the rise of Islam, Christians and Muslims in the Islamic world um, live, together, live together relatively peacefully. Um, and this, at least in the Arab world, is because they shared worldviews. And so I think um, if there are differences in culture and differences in religion, differences in political ideology, then we begin to see conflicts. But Arab Christians and Muslims sharing the same language, the same, um, the same uh, uh, land, the same um, culture, the same history, have often found points for collaboration in social and political movements, and have often deepened their, their Christian understanding through the model of daily life, because those common worldviews are shared and that enables um, deeper relationships. And you can see that in the Middle East even today. The sixth point brings us back to the United States and the recognition that American Muslim communities have deep roots here. In the 1700s to 1800s, the first Muslims in the US were mainly enslaved West Africans. From the 1870s to World War I, they were mainly Syrian Arab immigrants um, from the, the Ottoman Empire who migrated along with Syrian Arab Christians. Um, from the 1920s to the 1960s, there was a growth of Islam in the African-American community through conversion. And then from 1965 to present, um, 1965 was, was the time when um, U.S. Congress opened borders and eased some of the, um, the very strong restrictions on immigration from outside of um, Western Europe. And so that's resulted in a multi-ethnic community of Muslims in the United States. Um, so looking at this history and the ways that that American Christians and particularly white American Christians have responded, I see a pattern of racialization of American Islam. And so that has included suppressing or discounting African American um, or African Muslim identities. You still see that today um, in the, the perceptions that most Arabs are Muslims, most Arabs in the US are Muslims. Um, that relates to conflating Muslim and Arab identity, um, where in reality, the majority of Arab Americans are Christian. Um, there's a racializing of Islam as out of place in America. Um, so not quite fitting in because of difference of religion and difference of race. And then um, since, the, since the early 20th century, but we see it even today, there's been a pattern of nativist legislation and immigration bans that are targeting particular regions of the world. Um, and I think that in the early 20th century, these were focused on the differences of race and wanting to keep the United States a, a certain demographic population. And more recently, they've been targeted specifically at, at nations that are majority Muslim. Adding to that, point seven, I would say, racialization of Islam and assumptions about gender endanger Christian Muslim relations. And I wanted to share with you what Roshan Iqbal, who is a professor of religious studies um, here in Atlanta or Decatur at Agnes Scott College said about this. She said, there are three deeply intertwined misperceptions that most global North people, so in, um, in the United States or in Europe, have about global South people. Um, these perceptions are about oppression of women, about endemic violence, and about backward infrastructure, scientific development, and cultural development. And she goes on to say that these have applied specifically to the ways um, that people in the US and Europe have thought about Muslims in other parts of the world. And much of what Americans say about Islam and Muslims today, I would say falls into one of those three categories. Implicit views of race also play a role, as I mentioned before, particularly for white Christians who view Muslims as religiously, culturally, and ethnically different. Fear of Islam and xenophobia usually go hand in hand. 
And American Muslims are often considered foreigners because of their complexion or attire, even if they're several generations um, of, uh, after immigration to the US. Um, so consider, for example, one story from 2018. This is the story of Janan Ayesh, who is a native of Detroit, born to parents of Middle Eastern heritage. When she was traveling in Dallas in 2018, another woman verbally abused and physically assaulted her. The woman told Ayesh to go back to her country, hit her, and pull the scarf, the hijab, off of her head. And Ayesh later recalled um, saying this, as I was explaining to her, this is my country. Um, so, and, and often because um, those Muslim women who do wear the hijab, the headscarf, they're identified as being such, and it's often Muslim women who are, um, bear the brunt of Islamophobia. So what we Christians think about Muslims is often tied to our views of nationality, of ethnicity, of language, of culture, or gender, of being um, out of place or belonging in the US. And as Dr. Iqbal noted, people are not always aware of the deep interconnections of these various identity markers, and they don't really want their misperceptions to be corrected. I think this is especially true when assumptions about others reflect the understandings of the self. I mean, that's why I started in the first several points, um, encouraging us to reflect on our own perceptions, to reflect on our society and our place in it, and to reflect on what our faith calls us to do. Um, so we do need to be challenged to change um, or to challenge or to, um, to look deeper at any misperceptions that we may have. Um, and it's difficult because it requires us to be vulnerable. Point eight is that Islam and Christianity are both extremely diverse traditions. Um, and so noting the diversity of Islam, I think it's also important to notice the diversity of global Christianity. But I thought I would start by sharing um, the statistics on the global Muslim population by country. And this actually comes from uh, the Pew Research or the Forum on Religious and Public Life from the Pew Research Center in 2010. So the actual numbers are a little bit out of date, but I believe um, the, the rankings are about, um, are, are similar. So Indonesia is the largest Muslim country, uh, a Southeastern Asian nation, um, not an Arab or Middle Eastern nation. Second is India, third is Pakistan, fourth is, fourth is Bangladesh, um, fifth, so um, in South Asia. Fifth is Nigeria in Africa. And it's not until we get to number six to Egypt that we find an Arab Middle Eastern country. Um, Iran also in the Middle East, but a Persian cultural country. Um, Turkey in the Middle East. Algeria, Morocco, and North Africa. So this gives you an, a, at least an idea of the expanse of the Islamic world um, that it is beyond the Middle East. But looking to Muslims in America, in terms of place of birth, the majority are born in the US. Uh, the second largest um, origin of immigrants is the Middle East and North Africa, and 16% is South Asia. Um, migrants from other places are, are smaller. And I believe it's still um, correct that the, the largest Muslim immigrant population from a single nation in the US is from Pakistan. Um, in terms of racial or ethnic identity, how Muslim Americans self-identify, the majority of them identify as being white. And that includes um, European Muslims, um, Caucasian Americans who have converted to Islam, but it also includes a significant number of Arab and Middle Eastern Muslims who, um, because of that history of nativist legislation and um, the denying of of citizenship to anyone who is not deemed legally white. Um, Arabs have self-identified as white. 28% um, of Muslims in America are black. 20, another 28 are Asian, and you see some um, Latino and other. So you can see the, the ethnic diversity in the American Muslim population here. And in terms of denomination, um, Sunni Muslims, that's the largest um, Muslim group in the world, Shia Muslims is smaller. Um, in the United States, we have a, a larger number of Sunnis um, in comparison to um, the, the populations around the world, smaller number of Shias. And then 24% um, of American Muslims self-identify as neither or just Muslim. So we might ask ourselves how these demographics um, uh, compare to the demographics of Christians in America. 66% um, Protestant, 29% Catholic, other groups are much smaller. 66% of American Christians are white, 16% um, Latino, 13% self-identify as black. Um, other groups are smaller. And then the number of Christians in the US who are immigrants or children of immigrants is 23%. So I think that's helpful to understand as we compare the demographics, but we might ask ourselves how well these demographics actually explain American Christian life. Um, I don't know what you all think about that. I'd be glad to hear your, 
your input. How much does this tell you about your own personal faith and life in the U.S.? Um, some scholars who are, or um, for example, if a Muslim friend asks you to explain American Christianity, um, what categories would you choose? Would you look back at these demographic, um, these demographic uh, statistics? Would that be enough to tell them? Or how else would you explain the, the variety of Christian communities in the U.S.? Some scholars um, who, who study Islam in America have um, pointed beyond those demographic statistics to identify um, ways of life and understanding and worldview um, and, and social practice um, that, that really um, show how diverse, what the diverse ways of being Muslim in America are. Um, and so this list comes from Abbas Mbarzagar, um, who, uh, who is um, a native of Georgia and taught at um, Georgia State for a while and now works with the Council on American Islamic Relations. So he identifies Abrahamic Americans, social activists, Salafi Sunnis, neo-traditionalists, progressive reformists, and homeland homesick. Um, and as I read what he said about each category, I'd encourage you to think about um, how similar or different some of these ways of being Muslim are um, to ways of being a, a Christian in America. Um, so first, and, and this um, is from the chapter that some of you may have read for today. First are the Abrahamic Americans. They envision the United States as a Judeo-Christian nation, um, and they have strong civic engagement. Second are the social activists. They address social inequalities through grassroots activism, often alongside members of other faiths. There are the Salafi Sunnis. They, sit, um, they, they are um, religiously conservatives who seek pristine Islamic practices and the literal study of scripture. There are the neo-traditionalists who are also religious conservatives, um, but they practice Sufi rituals, which is the Islamic um, mystic tradition and traditional Islamic studies. There are the progressive reformists. I think we can, um, the social activists and progressive reformists, at least we can find in American Christianity. So the progressive reformists reinterpret scripture from feminist, post-colonial um, and LGBTQ perspectives. And finally, the homeland homesick are migrant communities, recent immigrants, who find a sense of home in ethnic or culturally based Muslim immigrant communities. Um, so take a moment as you look at this list and consider whether you find, um, how often you find American Christians fitting into similar categories. And um, here are some uh, photos of American Muslim leaders in Atlanta today, um, specifically um, some of them from the Atlanta Masjid of Al-Islam. Um, you see the, their Imam Suleiman Hamid in the middle, and that's the largest and oldest African American Muslim community in Atlanta. All right, we're getting to number nine. And number nine, I guess the preface should be that empathy is a requirement for deep interfaith relations, for deep Christian Muslim friendship. Um, and so I want American Christians to know that sympathy is based on sameness, but empathy understands difference. Um, so if we think about the golden rule, um, we need to tweak it a little bit um, to get a little bit closer to empathy. We often say, treat others as you would want to be treated. Um, and that's an example of sympathy. Sympathy um, asks me to, to step into my neighbor's shoes and imagine um, how I would feel if I were them. And so it's based on my own context, my own experiences. Um, some of you, if you read the chapter and you read about Kamala Khan, um, the new Miss Marvel, and her experiences as a teenager, even apart from her own particular Pakistani Muslim tradition, um, I think uh, many of us can resonate with her teenage angst, her relationship with her mother and her father um, as kind of a quintessential American experience as being teenagers. So that's sympathy, if we've had the same experiences and we can resonate. But empathy, um, empathy is the ability to project oneself into the life experiences of another person to put yourself into their shoes, um, a person of other faith, for example, in order to understand that person's sense of identity and religious commitment on their own terms. So empathy asks us to treat others as they would want to be treated. And it's a little bit more difficult if you don't know what it's like um, to be living in their shoes. Um, so we can practice empathy through um, empathetic listening. Um, here are some key skills there that actually can apply to all sorts of um, areas of our lives. Willingness to let the other party dominate the discussion, attentiveness to what's being said, care not to interrupt, use of open-ended questions, sensitivity to the emotions being expressed, and the ability to reflect back what the other party said. And that means you're, you're striving to understand what they said on their own terms. Um, so you can use this in personal relationships. 
and it's also helpful in informal interfaith dialogue experiences. Um, to move a little bit deeper into how we develop empathy, um, I'm offering a model for developing intercultural and interreligious awareness. This comes from the intercultural work of Milton Bennett. And he says that most people, when they, when they confront any sort of difference, cultural difference, um, for example, they move along this spectrum from denial to integration. Um, so if you're at the stage of denial, um, then you're disinterested and you avoid difference. If you're at the defense stage, then you view the world as us versus them. And that's where we get a lot of the, the interreligious conflict, the us versus them. The minimization stage um, challenges us to view others as basically like us or believe that, um, that others operate on the same basic set of values. So when I talked about sympathy, I would say minimization is, um, is like sympathy. Um, it only works for, um, for deep relationship building if that person is actually basically like you. But that's certainly not always the case, um, particularly in interfaith relations. Um, so the bigger step is toward acceptance, to acknowledging and respecting cultural difference and to see the complexities of difference. So to expand your worldview to include the worldviews of others. And if you move even further to adaptation, um, then you're so familiar with a particular culture or religion that you can take the perspective of another to behave differently in other cultures. Um, and fin the final stage of integration um, can happen for people who are bicultural or children of parents from two different cultures, where their sense of self includes the movement in and out of different cultures and where they feel at home in both cultures. So I've applied uh, Milton Bennett's model to developing interreligious awareness, where the movement from denial um, all to, um, into uh, the interreligious mindset is most important. Um, so I think minimization is the first goal if we could all recognize our commonalities, um, our common humanity, then this society and this world would function uh, much better. We'd be able to live together um, in true peace, but we wouldn't know our neighbors as deeply as we might um, because we, don't, we wouldn't um, understand the differences in our ways of life or in our religious traditions. Um, so minimization or sympathy is the first goal, um, but empathy is the second goal. And I would say that um, anywhere from minimization all the way up to integration is a fine place for American Christians to land. Um, but crossing that, that dotted line in the middle would be important um, if you want to develop a, a truly um, empathetic relationship with um, Muslim neighbors or neighbors of any other faith. And so your task is, is to see the world through others' eyes, um, to avoid projecting your own views um, and values upon others. Um, and then you can see moving to adaptation would be moving into deeper empathy where you really um, have that relationship has changed you so that you're able to operate in more than one religious context. Um, integration, I think, is a place where most religious people um, don't get to. It, it has been difficult to be religiously hybrid, uh, but there are some people who identify themselves um, in that way. So I say, again, anywhere between minimization to integration would be um, a positive um, uh, um, um, a positive change for, for many American Christians. Um, and so the last thing I'll say then, after you've taken account of, of the first nine points, um, is that good intentions must be translated into concrete action. Um, so we, before we talked about changing our thinking and considering our attitude. And I think that there are a lot of American Christians today who are very open to interfaith dialogue if they had the chance to do it, um, who don't, um, think negatively about Muslims um, just because they are Muslim. Um, but the challenge is to move from that, that um, good intention, that good feeling about someone um, to actually taking action. And I think that that's where, um, where maybe many of us need to push ourselves and um, because we may end up si standing by silently and acting as if perhaps we condone Islamophobic actions um, where deep inside, you know, it angers us, but we haven't moved forward um, to actually address those problems that we see. Um, so to take action, you can build interfaith friendships, you can begin supporting your Muslim neighbors. Um, and in closing, um, I thought that I would share um, some of the responses that, um, that American Muslims in Atlanta gave to me when I asked them what, um, what American Christians could do to build better Christian Muslim relations. Um, so now these are things that, the, that um, your Atlanta Muslim neighbors are asking you to consider. One person said, get to know me and then stand up for me. Another said, be willing to listen, engage and help. Be an ambassador who would be willing to clear up misinformation about Islam and Muslims 
and counter Islamophobic ideas. Another said, speak up in the presence of Islamophobic comments by others and make it clear that those sentiments of hate and fear are not welcomed. Another said, share examples of your relationships with Muslim friends to humanize the idea of a Muslim person. So sometimes the, the building of Christian Muslim relations uh, is about what you say um, to other Christians and not necessarily to, um, to what you're doing um, with your Muslim neighbors, but a, a way to, to share from your example with others who may have misperceptions. Um, and the last one I'll share with you um, is this response. We need innovative counter media campaigns and these must go well beyond documentaries and NPR. Allied faith communities need to be making blockbuster movies that effectively offer narratives of new possibility. Um, so there's a challenge for anybody who's in the film industry here in Atlanta. And then I will just close, um, as I know um, that your church is gonna be continuing this work on Christian Muslim relations with some practical guidelines for dialogue and community building. And um, that can be helpful just for setting the tone in any sort of interfaith event. Um, so what should we do um, in an interfaith um, setting? We should strive for mutual respect, understanding, and trust. We should honor the humanity of each person and the integrity of each tradition. We should allow others to define themselves while listening attentively without interrupting. We should listen empathetically, showing sensitivity to others' emotions. We should be able to reflect back to our conversation partners what we heard and understood. We should consider our own assumptions and speak honestly about our sense of identity and feeling without blaming anyone. We should articulate and acknowledge differences without debating who is right or wrong. And we should identify what we find beautiful or inspiring in that other person's life or tradition. I really like um, that last point. I think, um, I think when we get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, we don't um, often take the time to, to um, note what we find beautiful, but particularly what we find beautiful and inspiring in other people's lives. So with that, I will close uh, the slideshow and we'd be glad to hear your comments or questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Womack. My yeah. pleasure. If there are any questions in the room, we'll go ahead and take those. And then if there are any questions online, you can go ahead and chat them and I will then translate them out loud for the people in the room and for you all online too. I guess you answered all our questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> or I could. <laughs> Or I confuse people so much. That I, I see, I see a thing. hand. <laughs> Paul's got one. Paul, go ahead. I was just curious, uh, you know, the community that we're going to be engaging with is the Somali community. <clears throat> On your slide for you, uh, you listed the different ways of being Muslim. Um, are the Ismailis known to be not one of those areas, or they just split across all those areas, just like, you know, Christian. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think I heard it all. Um, were you talking about the, the slide on American Muslim diversity? Uh, the slide that was uh, kind of different ways of being Muslim, uh, uh, where yes. there were um, theological conservative yeah um that's a great question so the ismaili community and um, particularly in atlanta and and maybe in other parts of the country um that i'm not familiar with are very actively involved in in social justice work and in or in humanitarian work and in interfaith um, relations. And uh, there's certainly um, through the Aga Khan Development Network, which I think you'll learn about um, in your in further conversations, um, they are involved around the world with educational and other humanitarian work. Um, so they are a, a community um, within the, the Shia tradition. They're one of the branches, a smaller, um, a smaller Shia group. And um, they have their own living imam, which is a little bit different 
than um, some than most other Muslims around the world. And for that reason, they have often been persecuted. Um, so many of the Ismailis that I know in Atlanta are um, of South Asian descent, um, but they've lived all around the world. Um, um, and uh, they have um, a huge development networks in Africa in particular. So in terms of this list of, of diverse ways of being Muslim in America, um, I should also say that there may be other ways of being Muslim um, and it would be important to ask the Ismailis where they think they stand. But I would say um, the, the Ismailis that I know are, um, they talk about Abrahamic faith traditions. They're very active in interfaith work. So perhaps the Abrahamic American or the social activist um, would would be where I see um, the Ismailis that I've been in conversation with um, falling, if, if that's helpful in answering. I was just thinking um, a lot of Christians, um, Catholics, Protestants, whatever, who um, identify as Christians, but in fact um, have very beliefs and practices because on the interior, even though they say the creed, they believe lots of different things. I assume that must be the case of Islamic folk, but, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I think you answered um, the question that I had about how you would describe um, Christians in America and that diversity um, if a Muslim friend asked you. Um, and so I think it's similar. Um, we might not find exact par parallels, um, but certainly um, we find Christians that don't believe the same way that, that we do. Um, or who express their faith in, in ways that um, we might not, or um, who might surprise us in, in, um, in challenging us to express our faith differently. I think that you would find um, the same thing if you talked with um, American Muslims. I think, um, I think in the United States, I would say most Christians in this, maybe people wouldn't agree with this, is that everybody has their own individual faith. Hmm. That, you know, we recognize that our relationship with God and the scripture and, and our own history is very individual. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the follow up, but maybe it's the same question. Yeah, I think that's helpful in a sense because Christians have often, often thought about Islam as a very rigid, rigid, um, strict tradition that requires everybody to be exactly the same. So it helps not only to see the differences in, in ways that individual Muslims express their tradition, but also to know about the history of interpretation of Islam and, and the way that there are, are different interpretations of the same um, religious practices and, and guidelines. Um, so I think that is, it is help, a helpful starting point to, to begin with what you see in American um, communities and then ask your Muslim neighbors or, or the panelists um, that you'll have the chance to meet um, next week and um, what it looks like from their perspective. Thank you, John. We probably have time for one more question. Folks, we haven't heard any questions from you. This is Aaron, if you can hear me. Um, yes, I can hear you. I, I don't. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm hesitating to ask this question because I don't know how to how to phrase it. Um, but I guess it's, I'm struggling personally with my understanding of, um, and really judgments around, um, gender issues in, in, um, different communities. And it's hard for me to figure out what part is, is religious, what part is cultural and just how to better understand that. And, and in order to help me not feel so judgmental about, um, how women are treated around the world? That's a great question, and I think that you're um, you're sitting at, at a good place of tension, where you you're recognizing um, that the way that you're thinking about Islam and gender might not be the way that Muslims think themselves. Um, but then, you know, we also have the pull to um, to to compare everything to sort of our ideal, um, and so I think that's that's an important place to start. Um, one thing that I will say is as um, many progressive Muslims will say that the, um, 
the um, the struggles that some women have around the world, some Muslim women have, um, you know, are cultural or they're political, um, and they're not um, and they're not religious. And I think that you could see that in many Christian societies, including in the United States and certain Christian traditions, um, where um, where women don't have the freedom to do um, what they like to do, um, and, and often um, in around the world. Um, these are women living in, in very, you know, in li living in poverty, living in um, difficult political circumstances. So as you said, I think it is difficult to say, you know, is this, is this their religion? Um, certainly some people interpret their religion in ways that we would say is not liberating for women. Um, one other thing I will say that often comes up when talking about women in Islam is the, the headscarf and the hijab. And I think because, especially for Protestants, this hasn't been part of our tradition, um, the, the teachings about modesty in, in Islam and the choice um, that many, uh, at least American Muslims, make to wear the hijab, um, I think is, is something that we, um, uh, that we don't completely understand. And so I think it takes the relationships uh, with women who choose to wear the hijab um, to ask why they do and, and to talk with other um, women in our communities um, who are Muslim who don't wear the hijab and how they interpret teachings in their religion about modesty. Um, so if, I mean, if that is helpful, there are certainly places in the world where uh, Muslim families require their daughters to wear hijab. There are certainly places, even in the United States, um, if you think about the expectations placed on women for what they wear in church, for example, particularly women leaders in church or in churches where women are not leaders, um, it's not the same uh, form of dress, but I think that there are some parallels there. Um, and so I would say it seems to be the, the tendency of humanity um, to use um, to to take to use religion for power and control, and, and often cultural um, cultural assumptions draw on, on those um, religious teachings. I hope that's I hope that's helpful. I think it's a it's a complicated question because some people will say um, Islam is is a religion of justice for women, and some people would say that for Christianity. But I think it's only if we apply um, those teachings um, uh, correctly in the world. Um, that that we have um, that we have women who are, are treated humanely everywhere, and so I, I really don't think it's something that is uh, religious. Um, that I think that it is um, it's human and it's cultural um, in ways that power, gender, and power um, have worked um, to oppress and hurt people in terrible ways. Um, but there are also ways that religion can be used um, to liberate. Thank you. I appreciate you. It's a very nuanced and challenging topic. So thank you. For that. Thanks for the question. Um, I see a, a comment in the chat that I could read if that's helpful. Tracy says, one thing I recently learned was the high level of representation for women in parliament in certain Arab countries in deep contrast to our own levels of representation um, that surprised um, her based on her assumptions. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot that we can learn um, by having a, a broader global perspective. And, and comparing that to our perceptions and, and what we see in our own society. I, I just want, wanted to remark that those of us who are not asking questions, I think we do have questions for you. You've given us a lot to think about and my own inclination is to reflect on what we said and then at some future date have an opportunity to ask. Uh, the question's been asked for great. I just, for myself, I'm not there, but I'm, but I'm listening. <laughs> That's great. And I think you're going to have um, some opportunities in future weeks to do that. So take your time in the coming weeks and, and think about um, what would be helpful for you to know. Um, and Jim says that in Indo Indonesia even had a Muslim woman as a president. If you can imagine a woman as a president, um, it has not happened here. That's a, an important point. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Womack. Yes. It's such a, a thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, and and hopefully sometime in the future we'll see each other in person. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So good to see you.